Let's look at all the types of medieval helmet from 500 to 1500 AD. Hi folks, Matt Eason here, Scholar Guide Chart, and yes, this is a vast, vast topic. But obviously if we're going to talk in more detail about specific types of uh, helmet from specific periods, then we need to have an overview. So this is an attempt to, as concisely as possible, try and categorize and go over all of the main, not necessarily all literally, but all of the main types of medieval helmet used throughout the Middle Ages from 500 to 1500 AD. Before I go on, I want to mention that this video is very kindly sponsored by Wondrium, linked below, who formerly were known as the Great Courses Plus. And it's an absolutely colossal resource uh, for learning all types of things. It could be about history, it could be about art, it could be about literature, it could be about um, certain sports or activities, hobbies that you're involved with. So it's an absolutely massive resource and we're going to hear more about Wondrium later on in this video. So I previously did a video somewhat like this one, talking about all the types of medieval polearm. And it was quite an ambitious video, but I think it was quite well received. So I thought, well, let's try and do another one about helmets. Now, pole arms and helmets are both incredibly important things in Middle Ages medieval warfare. Um, first of all, pole arms were the primary weapons on the battlefield alongside missile weapons. Um, but helmets are the most important piece of armour. So right the way across this thousand years, we've got two main sources for describing what type of helmets were worn. Number one, there's the surviving helmets. Number two, there is art. Now, art is obviously problematic because there's bias. There's uh, trying to represent things from uh, history, biblical stories, fantasy, uh, legends, things like this. So they're not always represented things that are real. They're sometimes representing things from the past or things that are imagined or essentially fantasy. With the surviving objects, we have survival bias. So often the things which survive to us survive because they're particularly good or they're particularly high status, princely, or the things that, that got put into a grave when other things weren't put into a grave, they were recycled or used until they wore out. So there's problems with both of those things, but we have to bear those in mind. Let's crack on anyway. So after the uh, Western Roman Empire essentially started to crumble, there was a period which is commonly known in the archaeological world as the Migration Era. And this was an era in which people moved around Europe, uh, the Franks, the Angles, the Saxons, the Ostrogoths, the Visigoths, and so on and so forth. But in addition, there was an exchange or change rather of culture. So in some cases, it wasn't movements of people, it was movements or shifts of cultural emphasis. And so in some cases, the material culture, for example, swords, helmets, armour, um, spearheads, things like this, changed from what they had been used uh, under the Roman period to new types uh, that were uh, more influenced by the new emerging cultures and power bases. But that being said, with helmets in particular, what we actually see is a continuity from the late Roman era. So there were certain types of helmet that uh, developed, evolved, and were adopted within the late Roman Empire in the West um, that were essentially uh, based on other cultures that they were in contact with. They were based on development within the empire itself. But what's interesting is when we get into the migration era, we see certain helmets which might be decorated, for example, in very Scandinavian Germanic ways or in Frankish ways that are influenced by Roman helmets which went before them. When we look at certain helmets from the 600s from England and from Scandinavia, for example, where we can see there's a strong connection to the Roman helmets which went before them. These are actually constructed in a number of different ways. Sometimes they have a helmet bowl made of one piece. Sometimes it's made of various pieces constructed in various ways. Sometimes it's a lattice or cage. Sometimes there are just iron bars which were then filled with organic materials such as horn um, or hide in some cases perhaps inside to fill in those gaps. So there's various types of bowl construction. But very often we find that these have some form of facial protection or rather cheek pieces and uh, nasal or ocular or eye um, sections on them. And we find a variety within one area. So if you go to Sweden, for example, where we've got uh, a number of helmets surviving, then we actually find that they're not all of one type. They're actually slightly different designs. Um, so they've got different type of facial protection, different type of cheek pieces, and some of them have things at the back as well, sometimes a plate, sometimes hanging uh, smaller plates around the back. So there seems to have been, at least amongst the small data set that we've got to go from, we have to remember that this is the era which has been known by historians 
for a long time as the Dark Ages because we don't have a huge amount of either written or artistic or indeed surviving material culture data to actually draw upon. But based on the data set available, it seems that there was a high degree of individuality amongst the helmets. They weren't, although there's uh, common factors between them, there was still quite a lot of diversity. Um, in addition to that, in this same period as these kind of high status, shall we say, uh, helmets with cheek or face or back of head protection. There do also seem to have been simpler and more minimalistic helmets, which often took the Spangenhelm construction. That is, they are made up of a number of plates, usually with uh, either one um, bar going across the middle or sometimes crossbars and then with the plates filled in. And this seems to have been a common form, even going back into the Roman era, of constructing helmet bowls. And some of these helmets didn't have much facial protection and just seemed to have been a simple helmet that sat on the top of the head. And this is the type of helmet that we will see carries on through later centuries. In fact, it's quite likely that this type of Spangenhelm simple helmet that sat on the top of the head was the most predominant type of helmet worn by most soldiers who could afford helmets. And it's likely that there's a survival bias of the very uh, complex helmets with lots of facial protection and head protection around the sides and back. They seem to be higher status helmets and very often decorated uh, with gold and silver and other fancy things. This being said, there are some relatively simple, um, or should we say middle status helmets like the Pioneer helmet from England, which does have quite a lot of uh, facial protection with um, cheek pieces and back of head and so on and so forth. Uh, and this is relatively simple iron helmet, but nevertheless with quite a lot of protection. So what we find is during this migration era, there is a fairly large variety of helmets that can have varying degrees of facial or side of face and back of head protection, or indeed they can just be some a more simple helmet bulb. Now, if we move um, slightly later in the medieval period, if we now move into the 700s, 800s, 900s, we start to find some helmets, and we have to admit straight off the bat, there are a very small number of helmets from this era. And in fact, it's one of the big debates uh, in um, archaeology, why there is so few, why well, there are so few Viking era, if we call it that, that Viking era helmet surviving, really from anywhere in, in Western Europe. Um, but uh, we've got very few actual Viking helmets surviving, and a lot of what people describe as Viking helmets are actually earlier um, Vendel culture helmets, they're pre-Viking era helmets. But actually, if we go into the Viking era, very, very few helmets surviving. And we have to also recognize that one of the reasons that we've got fewer helmets surviving from this era is because of Christianity. So quite simply, in the earlier migration era, a lot of people, the Franks, the, the proto-English, the Angles and the Saxons, were pagan. Um, and quite simply, they buried their dead with weapons and armour sometimes, particularly the high-status ones. Um, and so when we go into the later uh, period, Christian burials don't involve those sort of pagan um, grave goods and gift giving uh, to, to the afterlife. And so we don't have the survival of swords and helmets and spears and other things that we did in the earlier period. We do in Scandinavia, of course, uh, for a time because... Uh, Christianity took longer to penetrate Scandinavia, or rather took longer to take over in Scandinavia. So we continue with the um, the old world, the Odin uh, burial of weapon goods, slightly longer in Scandinavia than elsewhere. But nevertheless, we have very few helmets to go from. But it does seem uh, that um, helmets in this period, again, like the earlier migration period, essentially split into two types. There's the, what should we call them, the more complex and fully enclosed type helmets, which sometimes involve cheek pieces, and nasals um, and back of head protection and sometimes involve spectacles as they're sometimes known uh, so a sort of ocular plate with uh, forms of cut out for the eyes particularly in Scandinavia probably and it is worth noting that it's uh, it's interesting if we look at one of the famous English helmets the the Coppergate helmet for example it has a lot of parallels with earlier helmets um, where it does have two cheek pieces and in this case it has a nasal and it doesn't look hugely different actually to late Roman era helmet, helmets, despite the fact that the Coppergate helmet, there's some debate about the dating of it, but it's probably from the 700s, maybe into the 800s. Um, so despite the fact it's centuries later, it's still, even in the decoration as well, it's still got a lot of parallels to earlier helmets. Um, but then if we go to the um, Yarm helmet, for example, um, then it has parallels with the ocular plate, it has parallels with certain helmets in Scandinavia. And Again, this probably isn't a, co uh, a coincidence because this is probably a helmet that is either 
a Viking helmet. In other words, it's either a helmet that has been brought over to England or made in England by people who were essentially Vikings, Viking settlers, or um, potentially it's an Anglo-Saxon helmet that is made in the style of uh, the Viking helmets that they saw uh, Vikings wearing. Um, so, and there was some debate about the, uh, how genuine that particular helmet was, but we now believe it to be genuine um, based on sci scientific analysis of the metal. Um, so uh, there were these complex type of helmets with facial protection of various sorts, but then there were also the simple type of Spangenhelm that sits on the top of the head, um, sometimes with a nasal, and we'll talk more about nasals in a bit, um, sometimes with nasals, sometimes without. Uh, and usually of a Spangenhelm construction where the top is made of either bars and plates or a series of plates. Now at this point it's worth diverging for a second to talk about Frankish helmets. Frankish helmets are a little bit problematic uh, because whilst we have a number surviving from what would have been uh, the, the Carolin Merovingian and then Carolingian empires, the Frankish empire which was of course controlling the majority of Western Europe certainly by Charlemagne's time. Um, and we do have some helmets surviving but then there's the disparity with what's shown in the art. Now I'm not going to go into a huge depth on this because this is a huge topic which would certainly warrant a video or several videos um, by themselves, but simply to say that the art in certainly under the Carolingians is somewhat untrustworthy in some cases because they're trying to represent certain things in the art, particularly trying to allude to their classical lineage. So uh, Charlemagne, of course, was crowned emperor of the Western Roman Empire, uh, a revival, a sort of renaissance, an early renaissance. And so he, a lot of what's shown in the art um, under the Carolingians is alluding to classical world Greek and Roman and Macedonian helmets. Um, and so what's shown in the art isn't necessarily what we find in the ground and in museums. There's a disparity between the surviving helmets and what's shown in the art. However, there are some parallels and we can see in the art certain helmets shown which seem to be pretty much straightforward Spangenhelms. And it does appear that the majority of helmets worn within the Frankish Empire were, and probably all over Europe, the majority of helmets were probably simple um, bowl helmets that went around the brim. Most don't seem to have had nasals at this point, although a few do. Um, and they seem to have had either one strap going around here and a strap around here, or a cross piece going over the top and a strap around here. And then the plates in between would be riveted into that. Sometimes some helmets are made of a series of plates, and this seems to have been more of an Eastern European influence that came in, perhaps with um, people like the Avars and other uh, groups who were on the borders um, to, to the East. Um, so. Simply to say, the majority of helmets at this time were a simple piece that sat on the top of the head. Some of them, however, still alluded back to those fancy helmets from the migration period and still had cheek pieces, still had nasals, sometimes had face plates of various types. So at this point in the middle of the video, I want to take a brief interlude to talk about the wonderful sponsors for this video who are Wondrium, formerly known as The Great Courses Plus. The Great Courses Plus has become Wondrium, and that means you now get more and diverse and broader topics than ever before. You still get all of the awesome stuff you had with The Great Courses Plus and a load of new stuff too. Wondrium is the place where you can learn about anything that you want to as well as probably finding some stuff that you probably never even wondered about before. Their carefully curated collection of short and long form videos, tutorials, how-tos, travelogues, documentaries and more is academically comprehensive, thoroughly researched, relentlessly entertaining and presented by engaging experts. In a nutshell, Wondrium is the place for minds that wonder. Wondrium is particularly useful for me uh, where I'm going into territory where I'm not particularly an expert on and I need to gain some extra background context. And you know I love the context on my channel and so Wondrium is great for that because it enables me to broaden my knowledge and deepen my knowledge on areas that I don't necessarily know a huge amount already. I've recently been watching a series on the early Middle Ages by Professor Philip Dayleader of the College of William and Mary um, and uh, in particular I really enjoyed the episode on the rise of the Carolingians because I studied uh, Charlemagne at both uh, school and university and what I hadn't really learnt much about was the origin of the Carolingians and it was very, very interesting finding out how they had risen up through the ranks essentially by strategically uh, using their position of mayors of the palace, essentially royal officials. If you've ever wondered about anything, Wondrium will be your new favourite place to hang out. And they're giving viewers a great offer right now with a free trial. 
Show your support for my channel by subscribing to Wondrium right now. Seriously, your brain's gonna love this place. You can type wondrium.com slash scholar gladiatoria into your URL box, or you can click the description just right below here, and that will get you to your free trial offer. And I promise you're, you're gonna love it. Um, so go and try it out. You've got nothing to lose at all. Thanks again to Wondrium for sponsoring this video and sponsoring the channel. Now, as we get closer to 1000 AD, there is a type of helmet which becomes almost the standard go-to helmet. And we see in art everywhere, we've got various surviving examples. And that is commonly known as the nasal helmet or nasal helm. And uh, that is a modern term for it, but it's called that because it very commonly has a nasal. Although, it has to be said, there were a lot of helmets still shown, certainly in art, and there's some surviving, which don't have a nasal on. But fundamentally, the type of helmet is essentially a conical helmet. Let's have a look here. Here we go. <laughs> it's a conical helmet. In this case, it's got a nasal riveted on. Sometimes the, uh, the nasal is one piece with the helmet bowl. Sometimes it's separate. Sometimes there is no nasal. But essentially, it is a either rounded or very slightly pointed um, uh, cone-like, usually bowed out, although art often shows these sides as, as straight, um, helmet which is worn on the top of the head and goes around the um, eyebrow line essentially. And this helmet rapidly became the standard helmet. Now we have to admit it's not that different to helmets which went before and indeed this stays around for a long time afterwards but we'll look at that in a minute. And, and this, many people would think of this as a Norman helmet and there's a good reason for that of course because around the year 1000 AD the Normans were the force to be reckoned with in Europe and they were going all, all over the place conquering lands and indeed all the way up to the first crusade um, uh, in 1090 they were, they were a very prominent force. And this was the go-to standard type of helmet worn at that time. And just because it deserves it, I want to reiterate that this was hugely popular. This was a massively, massively popular helmet that really was worn all over Europe, from east to west, from north to south, and beyond, in fact, uh, to North Africa and, and the um, Islamic world as well. A hugely popular type of helmet, um, and it could be made essentially in a number of ways. It could be one piece, like this. You can see that this is one piece bowl. And this probably would have been the most difficult, expensive, and high status version. But if we look at the Bayer Tapestry, for example, so in 1066, this was the standard type of helmet worn by both the English and the invading Normans and Bretons. Um, and they could be made in various ways. However, if we look at the Bayer Tapestry, you'll see there are usually vertical lines shown. So they were usually probably at that date in the 10 hundreds made of um, either a series of plates riveted together um, or a cross piece uh, with the plates, in other words, a Spangenhelm as it's known, uh, with the plates filled in between those crossbars. So a very successful type of helmet worn by almost everyone at this time. Now, did the faceplate type of helmet survive? Well, yes, they probably did in Scandinavia. They may have done in England to a bit, uh, to some extent. Possibly some of these had uh, cheek pieces, but by and large, it seems that this type of helmet took over. And importantly, it was worn with a male, commonly known as chainmail, coif. Okay, so because they started wearing mail around their head, they didn't need necessarily to have those faceplates of the earlier helmets. So we do see some early in the Vendel culture, some early experiments with mail being attached directly to the helmet, but it does seem in this period, because they started wearing the mail coif right the way around the head, they didn't need to have the plate cheek pieces or the plates on the back of the neck as much as in earlier periods. So they simply went with a simple helmet which just had a nasal and just filled that gap in the opening of the coif. This remained hugely popular, but after about 1150, um, this kind of mutated into a couple of other variations. There was a flat-topped variation and there was a round-topped variation. But all of these three, this, this type, the, the round one and the flat one, were all in standard use until um, after, uh, after 1200, until about 1250 in fact. We also say at this same period, a form of this, which we now know as the Cervelier, which was a type of proto-bassinet. Now we'll talk about bassinets later in this video. But what this essentially seems to be is minus the nasal and made closer and tighter. And it seems very likely that this was often worn 
under the male coif and perhaps have been developed originally for that purpose to wear under the male coif. So around the year 1180 it became a thing, uh, so we're talking about the, uh, the crusading period essentially here okay in the lead up to the third crusade, so it became a thing at this time to add a plate onto the front. So remember I spoke about the coif being worn here so there wasn't the need for the cheek pieces anymore. But remember, there were faceplates worn earlier. Now, the only opening available now, uh, either uh, apart from the bit that's covered by the, the nasal here already, is around the face here. So inevitably, uh, for whatever reason, they decided they were going to fill that hole. And they, so they started to put a faceplate, which took various different forms, and usually had uh, forms of hole or slot cut in the front to see and breathe through, of course. Um, so this plate at the front was actually very, very important and appeared really at the end of the 1100s. But once we get into the early 1200s, this starts to spread and grow around the sides, so it very quickly develops into what we would call the Great Helm. Uh, but that is usually accompanied by a larger flat top. Now, the possible reason for this is because the larger flat-topped form of Great Helm was worn over the male coif, and the male coif very often incorporated a plate cervelier as well. Why would you wear two helmets? Well, there's a number of things going on here. Firstly, we often see these great helms taken off, and so the people aren't wearing the great helms, they've just got a male coif, but a male coif on your head doesn't provide any real protection against from cuts, so you need a hard defence underneath it, you need the cervelier to take the impacts as well. So it's very likely that the cervelier was under the male, and there's another piece of evidence we often see effigies, that is, knight's tombs, where the statue, the effigy, um, actually has a kind of flat shape to the top of the coif. It's clearly not the shape of the person's head. So clearly underneath the mail there was, at the very least, some form of padding, but probably a plate cervelier incorporated in there as well. And occasionally the plate cervelier is worn over the top or is worn as a standalone defence on the outside. So we move away from, well, or rather, these were still worn at the same time. And in fact, if we look at um, uh, the Morgan Bible, for example, which is from the middle of the 1200s, is about 12, the 1240s probably, we actually see great helms worn along with flat tops, worn alongside both people in male coifs, which probably have cerveliers underneath in many cases, and alongside uh, nasal helms. So these helmets were still being worn um, in the middle of the 1200s by loads of different soldiers. So this great helm was a very universal, certainly in Western Europe, universal type of knight's helmet um, that was used um, extensively, usually on top of a male coif, which usually had a plate cervelier built into it, or at least in many cases did. And this was the kind of typical, and it's one of the most iconic knightly helmets. Um, and this usually had uh, slits to see through, and it usually had various types of holes or slits to breathe through as well, which incidentally you can also see through as well, they increase your vision. Um, so very important type of helmet, it offers a huge amount of um, head protection and it continued in use right the way through the 1200s and it, it first appeared in its fully developed form around 1220. Continued all the way through the 1200s into the 1300s but really just to say that the Great Helm was an incredibly successful helmet type Certainly in the earlier stages, it was usually worn over another smaller helmet, so a huge amount of head protection gave you very, obviously very, very hot and limited your hearing, but very, very huge level of head protection. And certainly through the 1200s and the first half of the 1300s was the typical sort of knightly helmet. Now the late 1100s and early 1200s would seem to have been a particularly fertile period for the development of helmets. And another helmet that appears around this time, end of the 1100s, is the so-called kettle helm or a chapelle de fer, or I prefer to call it an iron hat, as a straight English translation of the French. Um, so the iron hat was, as it sounds like, looks rather like a hat with a brim and is made of iron or steel. And it could be made in a number of different ways. It could have the Spangenhelm type construction with cross pieces. It could be made of a series of plates. It could be made of just one main uh, bar going across the middle and then uh, two side plates. Or indeed, it could be forged out of one piece. Generally speaking, in the earlier period, it seems to have been made of multiple plates and was probably a cheap helmet. Um, and we read of references to them being worn by lower class soldiers, but also occasionally uh, knights and even kings as well, uh, in the case of the Crusades. And um, they, generally speaking, the trend seems to have been that as time went by, they became more increasingly made of one principal um, bowl for the helmet. Um, so, 
The uh, Iron Hat was, uh, became, came in at the end of the 1100s and was a helmet that stayed around all the way to what well, we could say to the modern period, uh, First World War helmets, uh, certainly in British and American forces look somewhat like it. Um, but uh, if we're talking about the medieval period, all the way through to the end of the medieval period. So it was a very successful helmet. Uh, because the brim offers a good amount of protection to the face, uh, even though it's not in front of the face, it's above the face and protects from missiles and weapons sliding off the helmet and things like this. So it offers a decent amount of um, facial protection with the brim there, in addition to allowing you to breathe well, see well, hear a bit better and this kind of thing. So it's a good practical battlefield uh, campaigning helmet to wear. So this has been what turned out to be part one of what's going to be quite a big video. Looking at the helmets of medieval Europe 500 to 1500, this so far has been 500 to 1300. In part two we will look at the helmets from 1300 to 1500, which obviously is a, a big section by itself because there's lots of examples, the more artistic examples, more variations, we know more about this period. But hopefully you've enjoyed learning more or just revising the subject of helmets in medieval Europe from 500 so far to 1300. Please give me a like if you've enjoyed this video and a subscribe. Remember um, to check out that free trial link to Wondrium below, really worth checking out. And hopefully you'll be back here to tune in for part two of this video looking at the helmets from 1300 to 1500. Thanks for watching folks. Thanks for watching, we've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers folks.